Around about eight o'clock, the police find Marcus Cox, our victim, shot in the street. Uh, he's got multiple bullet wounds, four I'm now led to believe. Now, he's either slipped or he may have been winged with a non-fatal injury. He's gone to the ground uh, and then the gunman has walked up to him and put at least three shots, three further shots into him. We can't have people on the streets of Tottenham, Harlesden, Hackney, Lambeth, wherever it is, running around with guns, shooting at people, believing that they run the streets. Because at the end of the day, they don't. And, you know, they might be in a gang, but there's 30,000 in my gang, and we run the streets, not them, uh, in the bottom line. So people want to run around with guns, shooting at people, then we're going to come after them. And when we do, we're not going to give up. In March 2004, a fatal shooting took place on a busy shopping street in Tottenham, North London. 25-year-old Marcus Cox, a known local gang member, was chased and shot multiple times in broad daylight by 22-year-old Cyrus Martin. Mr. Martin made no attempt to deny his actions. In testimony, he claimed that Mr. Cox had previously kidnapped him, robbed him at gunpoint and demanded £20,000 ransom whilst threatening to kill him if he didn't comply. Mr. Martin said he brought a gun and body armour because he felt terrified and wanted to protect himself from Mr. Cox. When he encountered Mr. Cox on the street that day, Mr. Martin stated he panicked and his survival instincts took over. Prosecutors characterised the shooting as an execution style revenge killing, but Mr. Martin's defence attorneys were able to convince the jury it was an act of self-defence in response to credible threats made against Mr. Martin's life by Mr. Cox. While the jury acquitted Mr. Martin of murder, finding him guilty of manslaughter due to provocation, many in the community felt justice had not truly been served. The case highlighted complex ethical issues about limits of self-defence claims and the criminal justice system's ability to address broader social problems underlying the violence. While Mr Cox had a violence history, was it acceptable for Mr Martin to shoot him multiple times in public surrounded by innocent people? Can fear for one's life ever justify such vigilantism? The technical legality of self-defence could not erase the moral grey area area around proportionality. For witnesses who saw Mr Cox gunned down in cold blood, the verdict based on Mr Martin's self-defence rationale left a feeling that justice was incomplete. The case pointed to deeper social problems in communities plagued by crime, poverty and lack of opportunity. It raised nuanced questions about individual rights, ethics and self-preservation and the criminal justice system's limitations in addressing root causes. Ultimately, there were no perfect answers for this tragic situation situation involving the loss of life, self-defence claims and broader social factors. The ethical issues resist easy conclusions but highlight the need to thoughtfully examine our laws and social responsibilities around crime and justice. It provokes reflection on how we can build safer and more just communities through systematic solutions. In Tottenham, North London on a Friday night, Marcus Cox drove up to a takeaway. He saw a man he knew inside and motioned that he was going to kill him. Both men were carrying guns. The man left the takeaway, drew his gun and chased Marcus Cox's car. Caught in traffic, Cox abandoned his vehicle and ran up the high road, dodging bullets as the man chased and fired at him. Eventually, Marcus Cox tripped and fell. On Tottenham Highway, someone's just been shot. <laughs> Will you please come quick? <laughs> quick. On Tottenham Highway, he hasn't been. Gunshots. Yeah. Five. The guy in the white hood fell. He slipped. Yeah. And, and then the guy just shot him in the back. Witnesses say the gunman stood over Marcus Cox and shot him at point-blank range. Then he disappeared along Northumberland Park. Marcus Cox died on the pavement, lying on his own unused gun. 
The police need to trace two people, the gunman and his possible accomplice, a man who was seen taking the keys from Cox's abandoned car. Marcus Cox was 25. He was a prominent member of a local gang, the Tottenham Mandem crew. His long criminal record started with burglary when he was just 11. As he was shot by another black man, his murder is dealt with by Trident, an elite squad created in response to the black community's concern about such shootings. Around about 8 o'clock, the police find Marcus Cox, our victim, shot in the street. Uh, he's got multiple bullet wounds, four I'm now led to believe. Now, he's either slipped or it may have been winged with a non-fatal injury. He's gone to the ground. Uh, and then the gunman has walked up to him and put at least three shots, three further shots into him. He had an entry wound to the right hand side, just under his cheek here, just under his right ear. That bullet appeared to go right through his head, through his mouth, and pop out the other side. We believe, because the bullets come out and then got back in again, as if he was lying on the pavement, it's hit something, ricocheted, and gone back in, and the bullet was found just behind the skin. It's literally gone horizontal across the body. On his left shoulder, there's an entry wound. It's gone through the shoulder, down, straight down, and hit the top of the uh, main vessel above the heart. It's a mess. It's just blown to bits, and that's what would have caused his, uh, inj his death. Detective Sergeant Mark Brooks has worked exclusively on North London crime for the last 12 years. We can't have people on the streets of Tottenham, Harlesden, Hackney, Lambeth, wherever it is, running around with guns, shooting at people, believing that they run the streets. Because at the end of the day, they don't. And, you know, they might be in a gang, but there's 30,000 in my gang, and we run the streets, not them, uh, in the bottom line. So if people want to run around with guns, shooting at people, then we're going to come after them. And when we do, we're not going to give up. 70% of London's shootings are between members of the black communities. In the last five years, over 100 young black people have been shot dead. Tottenham in North London is best known for its premiership football team, but it's also a breeding ground for gun crime. Some black youths are tempted into a gang culture of drugs, money and guns. The day after Marcus Cox's murder, Specialist teams searched the 180-metre stretch of Tottenham High Road where the chase happened. They find eight bullet casings. One bullet hit a phone box and another a passing car. It was extremely lucky that no one else was hurt. Trident's North London murder team is 33 strong. They search for clues in Marcus Cox's past that might lead to a motive and the killer. As he was a notorious gang member, the list of possible suspects is large and growing. Detective Inspector Scott Wilson leads the case. It's the 35th murder he's investigated in the last 10 years. This is going to be a very difficult case uh, for the simple reason Marcus did have a criminal background. He had over 70 convictions and he did have a lot of enemies. He did have a lot of friends, as we know, but he did have a lot of enemies as well. He is a, a typical Trident victim in as much as he's part of a, a gang, the Tottenham Mad Dem crew, which associate with firearms and drugs, and he's quite high profile within that gang structure. So he's not a, a, a junior member who's, who's running drugs in the street, he's quite a high profile member of that gang. Detective Constable Paul Weekly is also on the team. He's a born and bred Londoner who joined the police 12 years ago. Marcus Cox is well known around the area. He had a, a liking for violence and into the uh, sort of gang culture around Tottenham, North London. And he was quite menacing, to say the least, and uh, the life he'd led certainly wasn't um, conducive to living a long life. Um, so I'll say you play with fire, you get burnt. But he was uh, his mother's son, and um, you know, everyone deserves the protection of the law. And therefore, it needs to be investigated and will be investigated irrespective of people's uh, history. Over 60 people saw the shooting, but none can name the gunman or his possible accomplice. 
Detective Constable Reg Rording is at the murder scene appealing for more information. A lifelong Spurs fan, he knows the area well. Were you in this area this time last week? No, we were in Whitehall. Were you? Best place. Yeah. Have you heard anything about it? Or? No, not really. No. Do you go for a drink now? Yeah. I'll oh, have one for me, will you? I will. <laughs> Take care. That's right. Quite busy, as you can see, but I mean, um, it, it's just uh, really being lucky to find the, uh, the people who may or may not have been here last week. Unfortunately, I haven't spoken to anybody who was actually here. I mean, I've spoken to two or three people who were here just before or just after. But we will persevere, hopefully, keep our fingers crossed. It's not raining anyway, that's the main thing. <laughs> Hi darling, sorry to trouble you. Yes. Were you here this time last week? Yeah, I was in the church. Safest place in the church? Oh yeah, <laughs> you think so? Well, is that where you're going now? Yeah. Alright, say a prayer for me then. Nice one. <laughs> Trident doesn't only investigate shootings. Some of its 350 officers and staff work proactively with the black community to raise public awareness about the gun crime problem. John Coles is head of Trident. This is the Respect Festival, which is a multicultural festival in Victoria Park in East London. We've got a Trident stand here because obviously it's an opportunity for us to actually get into the young black kids in particular. Because Trident's not only about targeting the gunmen, it's about trying to prevent young kids getting involved in gun crime in the first place. So we take opportunities to try and you know, get some face-to-face -face contact with the kids. Because uh, we want them to view us as, as a friendly uh, face as well as if they're a gunman, you know, a fearful face of us. It's just about spreading the word and trying to get people to understand what we're all about. Have you heard of Trident? What's that? Trying to stop young black boys shooting each other. What do you think about these people shooting each other? That's bad. It is bad, isn't it? So we can't be complacent, and in particular at the moment we're trying to get into the five, six, seven-year-old kids so we divert them away from any likelihood of getting into gun crime in the future. You will take some of our leaflets, give them to your friends, and give me a bag to put them in. Where do you live? Oh, do you? You come a long way then, across London. Yes. All right, see ya. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Detective Constable Rod Austin has been with Trident since it began in 2000. He's part of another team that investigates non-fatal shootings in South London. Gun crime spreading, and it's not just spreading within the black community, because we have got a gun culture. There's no doubt about it. We're simply adopting what's happened in, in America at the end of the day. People, rather than sort out their problems by arguing or fighting with fists, you know, it's gone one step further where they want, they want to start looking at um, where they want to take revenge with guns. And you get black-on-black -black shootings where peanuts are paid. I mean, favours are done. You know, just go and shoot him. Or they go and see, say to some youngster, here's a couple of hundred quid, walk around the corner and shoot him first, and they do it. It's madness. It's absolute madness. It's 11 a.m. and Rod Austin's been called to a shooting. It's rare. Most shootings happen after dark. Trident has just received a phone call um, from which station is it? Yeah, from Stretton um, Police Station to say that there's been a discharge of a firearm. We've got two black males. They have an altercation. One pulls out a gun and apparently uh, shoots the other. Just to run through it, we've got 11.13, there's a fight at that bus stop there, and there's two guys w with, with guns. Yeah. Um, one guy's been um, shot, he's got um, entry and exit wounds to the right upper thigh. Right. Um, we've got a MAC-10 in a pink bag. A MAC-10? A MAC-10. Jesus. The MAC-10 is a lethal machine pistol that fires 1,100 rounds a minute. It was the weapon of choice for US Special Forces during the Vietnam War. Just before you get to the barrel of the weapon, you can see some green tape. There's a small silver object attached to it, and that creates a laser, uh, which will obviously switch on, point at the target, and it'll help them to obviously shoot the right target. Um, very crudely done, but 
at the end of the day, relatively effective because you point, you get the laser sights at the right person, it'll just generally find the right direction. Very lethal weapon. A second gun was found at the scene, a 9mm pistol. In the past four years, Trident has seized over 650 guns in London. The days where you had the old-fashioned armed robber with the sawn-off shotgun, they tend to have disappeared. Uh, you know, they would just pull out the gun for that particular crime, shove it down their trousers or inside their raincoat, go in, do the armed robbery and walk out again. Our people are carrying the guns all the time. You know, they're with them 24 hours a day. So it has to be concealed so that we and the public don't realise they're carrying a gun. Most of the people we deal with use every single type of gun you can imagine. From machine pistols, to 38s, to 45s, to replicas, to converted weapons. Everything under the sun. One of the biggest challenges we face at the moment is where the guns are coming from. There's no doubt that some of them have been around for many years. But what we've seen of late are more and more guns that we can't really trace. And there's some suggestions that many are coming from the former Soviet Union, former Yugoslavia, and even current conflicts such as Iraq. But I don't think nationally we've really got a full picture on where some of these guns are now coming from. It's five days since Marcus Cox was gunned down in Tottenham. Some locals in the black community are now coming forward with information. Four different people have been put up as the gunmen. Each had a motive. Trident learned what might have provoked the shooting. Two nights earlier, Marcus Cox trashed the Jamaican's car after a fight in a snooker hall. The team turns out in force to see if anyone will confirm this story. They succeed. One man who saw the fight gives a statement to Reg Rording. He was uh, in a side room. Um, with friends playing cards where uh, all of a sudden the uh, noise level within the snooker club uh, went up as a result of an argument that was ensuing between the victim and uh, another person. Um, they went out to investigate and within seconds uh, the snooker balls were picked up and were, were being thrown around uh, the snooker club. About 45 minutes later the friend that he was playing cards with, Blacker, had his car smashed up outside the snooker club. Marcus Cox and four friends vandalised Blacker's £20,000 BMW parked outside McDonald's. Among London's gangs, this is more than enough to provoke a shooting. The hunt is on for Blacker. Mark Brooks and Paul Wheatley prepare to look for him and his damaged car. There are five Trident teams involved in the search. So, I don't want to take any risks, we're just kitting up just in case uh, he is armed and wants to fight. We're going to go and try and make some luck for ourselves. We've got a couple of addresses, so we're going to go and have a look for, and see if we can find a BMW now. Eyes down for a gold uh, Yeah, eyes down for, for a gold BMW coupe. Is it Paul Bly or Willow? On a wire edge. Now, we have a home address for Blackham, and maybe this uh, vehicle may be somewhere parked in the vicinity. We have obviously a murderer, or we believe to be a murderer at this stage, which intelligence suggests is a murderer, um, and he may still have access to that firearm or other firearms. If we locate his vehicle, we need to contain it. So safety in mind first. We'll just contain it and then get the, uh, the gunships down. Probably up until five years ago, we would have just stepped in and knocked on someone's door, not worried about our... Uh our own safety, but the rules have changed now, unfortunately. And uh, oh, it's like when we were at school, we used to fight with fists. Now it, it's gone through the, gun, the knife stage, and now it's at guns. So they don't fight fairly. They don't find Blacker or the car, but the next day they have more luck. The car is spotted and impounded. Marcus Cox and his friends had caused thousands of pounds of damage. Police across Britain are alerted that Blacker is wanted for murder. While he had enemies, Marcus Cox was also well known and popular. Over 500 people attended his funeral. He was the eldest child in a large family who regularly visit his grave. 
His mother knew of his criminal activity, but says it makes losing him no easier. We're all here today to celebrate his, not his death, but his life, and to show how much we love him and miss him. Because his brother's dad is here today. Out of love, it's not the first time we've been back. You know, there's always someone coming here, always. Yeah. Marcus Cox never met his daughter. She was born after he died. I would never, never wish this on my worst enemy, you know? Gosh, I would not wish this on anyone to lose their child, especially on their first child. Well, this is not supposed to happen, you know? It's supposed to be burying your child, should you really? They're supposed to outlive us, not we outlive them, you know? John Coles heads to City Hall for a meeting with leading figures from London's black community. They act as Trident's independent advisers. We're off to the IAG, which is the Trident Independent Advisory Group, which is a meeting held monthly with representatives of the various black communities from across London. Uh, and we have a very in-depth discussion about issues, but very forthright and very honest. And they say to us what they think. You know, if they think we're getting it wrong, they tell us. But at the same time, they do listen to what we tell them. And I think as time has moved on, they've actually become great supporters of what we've tried to do in tackling gun crime in London. Sorry, 9.2. We are hurting from this. And these people are not part of our community. They're dealing in debt, and we are the ones that are hurting at the end of the day. What I am concerned about is the fact that the more professional, more ruthless, more hardened offender within Trident's remit is gradually being reduced. And what we're seeing is the emergence of the kids carrying the guns who are not going out necessarily to kill, but they're going out carrying the guns to discharge them <coughs> these disrespect issues, these silly fallings out. And the shootings that are taking place are taking place over very, you know, pretty no, pathetic, no. ridiculous no. arguments. We are not going to crack this issue unless we all understand there is only so much 24 odd people can do. The issue is about bending the mainstream. It's about getting local authorities, education, youth service to do their thing so we don't have to bloody well exist. The following day, John Coles is back at City Hall. This time, he's speaking to a tougher audience. Has got to say, and then... Trident's advisors are holding an anti-gun conference for teenagers who may be tempted by drugs, money and guns. Good afternoon, uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just bring this a bit closer so you can actually hear me. I warn you now that some of the things I'm going to show you are quite disturbing. But guns are not fun. They're not cool. They actually really do hurt people. They really do kill people. It's not like you see in the movies. We're talking about real life here. So hopefully as we go through this, you will get to understand the message I'm trying to get over to you. Okay. Here you've got two guys who think it's cool to play with guns. Do you think it's cool? No. no. It's all about we carry guns here for protection. So if we carry guns for protection and that's wrong, how come you lot carry guns and that's protection? Well, after then the grave got dead, yeah? What's the police going to do? This is not a joke. Because actually, we want you to have a life, not die at 25 and 24. And I'm waiting for this group here, who don't want to be called kids, but are behaving like it. Disrespect. We're all black. We come from a black culture where you respect your elders. And I haven't seen much of it today. Shameful. The police are here to try and help you to help yourselves. You have any possibility to become who and what you want to be. But you have to stay alive to be able to do it. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? Right, next one please. That hat is the start of a trial to someone who's been shot dead. And he was chased 
down a North London street. His hat fell off first of all. Then, in his panic to get away from the gunman, he lost his shoe. Can you imagine how this guy's feeling? You've got someone with a gun coming after you. Imagine how he feels. And that, that picture there is a reality of life of what guns do to people. And if you go down this path, you're going to end up in one of three ways. If you're lucky, you're going to get nicked by a trident. If you're not so lucky, you end up dead, because that's the reality, or you end up seriously injured. In South London, Rod Austin investigates another shooting. A gun has been used during a petty dispute. This quiet street was the setting for an attempted execution, when an innocent man had a minor traffic accident with the wrong person. A young lady is driving down the road. She's got no driving license, no insurance. She was in a rush and collided with another car. And, you know, the damage to the cars are minimal. In fact, you can hardly see it. It's basically just scratches. It's got a bit, you know, you've got some paint chipped off there. And that's literally all the damage was. Basically, an argument ensued, as usual, with all, with all most road traffic accidents, as to who was to blame. Um, Jason Charles pulls out a gun, puts it in a matter of... Um, inches away from our victim's forehead and discharged the gun. By chance, the gun exploded. The victim was injured but survived. The victim's statement's quite graphic and he tells us that it all virtually happened in slow motion in the way he, he sort of raised the gun to his head. He then racked the weapon and held it there for a second. And he said basically his whole life simply froze and he said he was just, all he could, all he could think was, I'm going to die here, I'm dead, I'm dead. And he, was, he said time just stood still. And then he said suddenly he saw a bang, a flash, and uh, Charles had discharged the gun. A bullet um, hit the victim in the centre of the forehead, fragmented below, beneath the skin, um, and basically disintegrated. It just simply, well, it just simply disintegrated, and that was it. He's very, very lucky. He should be dead from that sort of distance, no doubt about it. Rod Austin thinks the gunman is Jason Charles. The car involved in the crash belongs to his mother. He is 25 and has six previous convictions for drugs, robbery and carrying knives. For six weeks since the incident, Jason Charles seems to have been lying low. Rod Austin and his team have failed to find him but now he has been spotted. Jason Charles has been seen entering a house which Trident are now watching. A convoy of officers are nearby, ready to move in and arrest him if and when he comes out. Arm teams are moving up. We let the armed officers go in and do everything first. We hold it one second. Yeah, fair <coughs> call. It's a change of clothing. Right. We're moving up now towards, we're now heading towards the Walworth Road. Jason Charles has left the house. Trident deal with gunmen like him all the time, yet their officers aren't armed. The suspect knows he's wanted and may be carrying a gun, so specialist armed police will stop him. The police have got to be very, very careful with someone so. like him. He's the sort of person that, if he's armed, may well turn his weapon on a member of the public or a police officer. Right, that's done. Right. Everyone stays put. We put the dogs through. We're basically, the, ar the arrests are, are being made now. Obviously, everyone's detained first, and we ensure that everything is done uh, quite neat and tidily. They'll be handcuffed, put in plastic cuffs, and we will, we will formally go up and c execute the arrest. Right. I'm going to enjoy this one. Yes, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Jason Charles was with a friend. Both have now been stopped by the armed police. Right, Jason, listen. Listen to me. It's 20 to 12, yeah? You've been arrested for attempted murder, all right? That occurred on the uh, 3rd of March of this year. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later on in court. If you do say, we'll be given evidence. Do you understand that? Jason? Do you understand that? <laughs> OK, that's a yes for now. 
Jason Charles is not carrying a gun, so the arrests have been made without risk to anyone. Another good trident operation. Yeah. <laughs> Spare Jason Charles was conditionally released from his last prison sentence seven months before the shooting. He doesn't have a job, but has £430 in cash. He has a previous conviction for drugs. Police think he may be dealing. With Jason Charles safely in custody, Trident want to find his gun. They are going to search the house he was in earlier. They don't know who's inside. It's 2 a.m. They don't get a welcome reception. No, you don't do that. That's the first thing that you don't do. The police officers, all right. All right, there's kids in here, for fuck's sake. Well, fucking calm it down, then. Trident want quick access to every room to prevent the disposal of evidence and reduce the threat from people inside. His dead name. My uncle's in there. We tried asking you, I'm afraid. I told you. You tried asking you. I said it's my uncle. Right. Should we have a chat? Right, come in. She is all right. Right, Jason's obviously been arrested. Has Yeah, Jason's been arrested and we'll come to search this address. Officers go into an upstairs bedroom. A teenage boy grabs a knife from the side of his bed. A big old knife next to his bed. Do you want this thing in the house with these young kids around? Right, good, we'll take that. It's um, always a problem when you go into these, these homes to search them when you... Um, Get out of it. <laughs> it's always a problem when you go in. You never know what weapon you're going to find. You find knives, samurai swords. You find you can find anything in people's houses. Um, all you can do is, you know, it's a 15-year-old youth um, with a knife. All you can do is turn and put it down, which uh, is obviously what he did, and that's the end of the matter, really. The only disappointing thing, we haven't recovered the firearm. We've now got to obviously prove it uh, in other ways. That's it. Until tomorrow morning. I'll wander off into the distance. <laughs> right. The day after his arrest, Jason Charles takes part in an ID parade. The man he shot picks him out. That's enough to charge him. Right, the first charge is for uh, attempted murder. <laughs> Second charge against you, that is being a prohibited person in possession of a firearm. Cox had uh, kidnapped a man a couple of months previously, and um, shortly after the kidnap, um, he saw Cyrus with what he describes as um, a Beretta pistol down his waistband, um, basically making idle threats that he was going to get even with guys that had, had kidnapped him. The name Cyrus has been about for the last three, four weeks. But so a number of names have come up from different cells and sources. But over the last week, the Cyrus has progressed, and it, well, we're quite confident the name isn't Cyrus now, and it says to me it's Siren, it's Siren Martin. Siren Martin was kidnapped on the 17th of January and beaten by Marcus Cox. The whole reason for the kidnap is Siren Martin is quite uh, a large time supplier of skunkweed and it is widely known that he has got money and therefore the motive for the kidnap was to rob him. Furthermore, we had intelligence to suggest that Siren Martin had left the country. A flight ticket was booked on the 6th of March, the day after the murder, and on the 7th of March he left London Heathrow to Kingston, Jamaica. With a lot of these suspects that have come up, they've all been victims at one stage of Marcus Cox. So there's obviously a lot of people out there that had motivation to do this, but without a doubt this has to be the mainline inquiry at this stage. During the kidnap, Siren Martin managed to escape before his family paid the £20,000 Marcus Cox had demanded. But Siren Martin refused to tell the police what happened. Now, come back for it, mate. We need a bit of a question. 
Although they believe Siren Martin is in Jamaica, Mark Brooks's team have a warrant to search addresses they think he used in London. They're after evidence linking him to the murder. First, they go to his family home. They don't know who might be in. Police! Police officers! Stay where you are! Police! Bathroom, bedroom. There's a bedroom here, which is obviously his bedroom. He's obviously grabbed a few bits and just left. The house appears to have been abandoned. A sniffer dog is brought in to search. They still need to find the firearm used in the murder. I don't think anyone would probably be that stupid to leave the gun here. If anything, they're going to throw it in an hour in the river or something like that. Um, but knowing that the murder took place on Friday and on Sunday, afternoon at 12.40 is flying out of the country, um, which is quite rapid. He's not going to have had the presence of mind to cover all the bases, so clothing, phones, correspondence, stuff like that. Hopefully we should be able to make a bit of luck for ourselves and um, recover some exhibits. Hello, Mark Brooks. While the search continues at the family home, Mark Brooks's team head for another address they think Siren Martin might have used. The occupier will have a reasonable amount of time to open the door. Um, he'll be told that, and if it doesn't open the door, then we'll put it in, we'll smash it through. Even if there's no one in, we'll be going through the door and search, so one way or another, we're going in through that door this morning. The only provider, in my opinion, if they got an iron grill across here. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> that would be a bit of a shocker, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't it? Put your headphones in that box. Hello? Can you open the door, please? There's no answer. They need to break through the door, but it has steel bars running through it. The team's ex-bodybuilder gives it a go. Body inches. Help! Someone in there? No, don't know. Body inches. <laughs> Alright, the building to pull down before the door does. <laughs> no, he's not going to go either. Try the hinges, Paul. Oh. Hinges? Try the hinges, <laughs> top and bottom. Try the bottom one first. <laughs> Bit higher. Open the, the door! Police! It's the police officers! I bust the door! Paul, you're going to have to open it with that now. Stay back. Hello, mate. Police. What's going on? What's your name? Sean. Sean what? Sean. 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 Right, come in. Go through, Sean. Sean. Let me explain you. I'm Operation Trident. How many locks he got on that door? Look, one, two, three, five. You pick up on the wall. The flat is searched for evidence, but the occupier is not who they expected. Yeah, okay. He has no criminal record and no link to Siren Martin. He'd planned a day off work and was fast asleep when Trident arrived. Smooth and new face, move for pads. The girlfriend. Are you sure? Are you sure? They've come with jokes, they've come with wolf dogs, so I might as well have a joke with them. I'll try to help them as much as I can, but what they're actually talking about, what they're looking for, I do not know what. They mean nothing to me, so they find anything, they find anything, but I'm sure they won't. The occupier's guess is right. There's no gun or other evidence at the flat. Very scary. Uh, you don't expect to hear that such, so much noise at 8 o'clock in the morning and to see six big burly men hammering at your door. So it was very scary at first, but they couldn't do a job, so I just lead them to it. He said, open the door, I said, you've jammed it. And then he hit it again, and it bounced off the hinge onto my head. 
I thought you was knocking a bit loudly to be the postman when uh, I was right. None of the teams have found the gun. But in another house, they found a bulletproof vest and newspaper cuttings about the murder. They're obviously showing an unhealthy interest in this particular case, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Some of the, the actual guys that do the crimes and that run in these gangs certainly like to read about their, their own doings. Lots of clothing carts in the lab and a bulletproof vest, which apparently he took to wear it after he was kidnapped and beaten up. So one would suggest that if you take to wearing a bulletproof vest, that you might be wanting to arm yourself as well. With their suspect in Jamaica, the North murder team turned their attention to his possible accomplice. They view footage from over 250 CCTV cameras. Only one caught any action. It shows a man taking the keys from Marcus Cox's car and running off. The image is not clear enough to identify him. Trident used mobile phone bills found in the searches to trace the calls Simon Martin made in the minutes after the murder. He repeatedly phoned Damien Brown, his mother's boyfriend. Between 8 o'clock and about 25 past 8, there's frantic activity on Simon Martin's phone. He actually makes uh, 12 phone calls in that 25 minutes period. Uh, about 10 of those phone calls are to Damien. Uh, this would indicate there's obviously something's went wrong between 8 o'clock and half past 8 and he's making these frantic calls to try and get in contact. And the same can be seen when we then uh, look at Damien's call data, the calls coming back that Damien's making calls back to Siren. So they're obviously trying to get in contact with each other uh, on, the, on the evening of the murder, straight after the murder. 32-year-old Damien Brown has come in voluntarily to be interviewed about the murder. He has a criminal record in America. It's the first time he's come to the attention of police in the UK. There was uh, at least two men involved in his murder. Uh, one of those chased the victim up the road and shot him, and the other one was last seen removing the car keys from the victim's vehicle before running off in the same direction. We believe we've identified a suspect. This gentleman was the boyfriend of that suspect's mother. Um, and we've spoken to this gentleman. He's given an account of where he was and what he was doing on that Friday night. Um, we have reason to believe that he wasn't where he says he was and that he was in Tottenham High Road. Therefore, he's been arrested this morning for s suspicion of being concerned with the murder of Marcus Cox. Sorry, Damien Brown says at the time of the murder, he was at home with Siren Martin. But the mobile phone evidence shows they were frantically calling each other. Before Trident can charge Damien Brown with any offence, they need to arrest Siren Martin, the suspected gunman. Number five, if he's char jointly charged with Siren Martin, and Siren Martin did the crime, and he's standing there facing a life sentence, then that might be the incentive he needs to talk and say, well, it wasn't me, it was Siren Martin. Uh, I'm sure he's aware of what sort of trouble he's in. Uh, so yeah, we just need Trident run ad campaigns to win public support. John Coles sees the latest proposals for this year's posters. A few things we can improve, but I think we're we're getting there. This one's light for everybody. It can take out a, a gunman just yeah, on one phone call, and I don't think there was any changes to that really, other than you know making the Trident brand more prominent and stuff like that. Yeah, I've got to say, um, it is entirely different to anything we've done before, and I am quite impressed. Whenever the posters have gone up, there has been a decline in gun crime. And there is improved effort within some of the communities to try and deal with the problem. Obviously, there are going to be some people that we will never, ever reach. Some of the main gunmen will never be influenced by anything we do, whether it's posters or anything else. I mean, sometimes they're not even influenced by the fact they've been arrested. But what we're actually trying to do is, is get to the community that are on the edge of this type of activity, to the mums, for example, whose son may or may not be at the stage where he's going to become involved in gun crime. And if, through something we do in one of those posters, influences that mother or that girlfriend to actually influence their son, boyfriend, so they don't take that path, then we've achieved something. It's six months since Marcus Cox's murder. When the prime suspect, Siren Martin, fled to Jamaica, he booked a return ticket for today. The North London murder team are at Heathrow, hoping he is on the plane. 
Yeah. Do we know what seat number he's in? Can we find Go on. 23 Hotel. Beautiful. That's lovely. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We're definitely folded. Lovely. Seat. 23 Hotel. It's all go. All go. You're number one, I'll go number two. We'll go number yeah. three. We'll go number two, we'll go number three. He's on the plane, so it means that we can get on with this job, get our interviews done and uh, hopefully um, put this to some sort of closure. It's too risky to make an arrest in a crowded terminal, so the team takes Siren Martin from the plane. So we went up onto the plane and um, there was Siren sat there um, looking all nervous, clutching his passport, landing card and his uh, Bible. That's why I arrested him on suspicion of murder. Um, but yeah, the, the other passengers looked quite surprised, to say the least. And he was handcuffed and then trans uh, third into that van there. Siren Martin is not the usual Trident suspect. He's never been in prison and isn't known to carry a gun. Well, mate, it's this, mate. <laughs> Take a guess. If you guess, you can leave. <laughs> Call him down police station. All, right. All he's carrying is a wallet, his passport, and a Bible. Uh, sorry, it's just a long flight. Are you thirsty? Yeah. Are you hungry? Um, no, I'm not. Do you want to, what do you want to drink? Water. Water? Yeah. Right. It'd just be tap water for that, do you? Yeah. Cold, yeah? Siren Martin was kidnapped and held to ransom by Marcus Cox six weeks before his murder. But in interviews, Siren is reluctant to talk about it. How did that incident affect you? No, I mean, your mother has stated that you changed in your personality so much that in her opinion you were like another person. Is this true? No, I mean. Your mother has also stated that you took to wearing a bulletproof vest frequently, even in the house. Is that correct? No, I can't. Yeah. Now, we've recovered a gun that was next to Marcus Cox. Did he pull a gun on you? No, I can't. Yeah. Did he try and shoot you? No, I can't. Yeah. Damien Brown, the suspected accomplice, also refused to comment in interview. But then he gives Trident a remarkable breakthrough. He tells them his version of what happened. My client has a statement to read at this point. Okay, are you going to record it? Yeah. Right now. Yeah, when you're ready, you're in your own time, In your own time. I was in Tottenham High Road shortly before 8 p.m. on March 5th. I had gone there to buy chicken for family dinner. Simon came with me to show me where it was. I had absolutely no idea that he had a gun with him when we left. While I was waiting for the order in the chicken shop, Simon said that he could see the person who had kidnapped him. I could not see who he was looking at but he started to approach a blue BMW. The driver of the BMW got out the car, produced a gun, and aimed it at Siren. He pulled the trigger, trigger three times, and I presume the gun was jammed because nothing came out. I then saw two shots fired in the direction of the driver who ran across the road, followed by Siren. I went to look at the car because I was concerned there may be another weapon inside. The keys were still in the ignition. I took them out and locked the car for everyone's safety. I ran after Siren to find out what was going on. At the corner of the street, by the tattoo parlor, the driver was laying on the floor. <clears throat> Siren had disappeared. That statement is in my handwriting, but my client has signed it, dated it, and timed it to confirm that he agrees with the content. All right, if you go with DC Smith there. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Damien Brown has bravely confessed to his involvement in Marcus Cox's murder. He claims he saw Marcus Cox try to shoot Siren Martin outside the takeaway, but the gun failed. He said Siren Martin was also carrying a gun and chased Marcus Cox up Tottenham High Road. Damien Brown admitted being the accomplice seen removing the keys from Marcus's abandoned car. After six months of complex investigation into seven suspects who each had a motive, Trident had the right men. Anywhere this time of night we can get a bottle of Dom Perignon. Hello. 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 
Okay. Yeah. Hold up. Huh? Hold up. How do you figure that one? I don't mean in a sarcastic sense. No, I'm not saying that. But there's nothing, there's no bright end to this whole thing. Well, you see it now. Huh? I'm just saying it took some courage to do that, and that's what I'm saying, mate, okay? The ripple effects of the Tottenham shooting highlight the intricate ethical dilemmas around crime, self defense, and justice. While the jury ruled based on specifics of the case, broader questions lingered in the community and beyond. Had a just outcome been reached, or did the verdict fall short? Where should society draw the line between self preservation and vigilantism? And how can we address the root causes that breed violence and injustice in the first place? The technical legality could not erase the moral grey area that left many feeling justice was incomplete. Perhaps there were no truly satisfying answers to be found within the confines of the criminal justice system. This heartbreaking case provoked deeper reflections on the ethics of law and our shared social responsibility. How can we reform unjust structures whilst also promoting human dignity? How to build communities where no one feels compelled to such extreme self-preservation? And how can we nurture a justice system that heals both perpetrators and the victims of violence. This incident holds up a mirror to social shortcomings that we must grapple with. The journey towards justice is ongoing. What do you think about this difficult case? Where do you stand on the ethics of self-defense and the boundaries of the justice system? What kind of solutions might prevent such tragic outcomes in the future? We welcome any perspectives on these complex issues on the intersection of law, ethics and community.